Okay. Again, good morning, everyone. This is the uh, the lecture on the evolution of the vertebrate limb, and um, we'll start with a simple question for you: When does life start? And I don't mean like when I finish my PhD answers like that. Uh, anyone who has a a good answer to this question? I'll wait until I get an answer. Anyone? When something can replicate itself. Ah, oh, but aren't isn't the original cells replicating? I mean, alive. Well, what do you mean? Um, when uh, molecules can replicate themselves to produce more similar molecules. Ah, so you're talking about the origin of life. Okay, so, I mean, I misunderstood the question. No, 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 it's, it's a tricky question, and you're quite okay. right. <laughs> that was the answer I was looking for. Uh, yeah, uh, life is a, is a continuous process, and it essentially started as far as we can tell, only once long, far back in time, billions of years ago. And um, what's happened since is essentially evolution. So what is evolution? Um, it's the gradual change over time. This is a not spectacular image, but it shows the evolution of whales from a land from land living creatures all the way to our current whales and um, most people who study evolution studies it on population levels they people are looking at elite frequencies or genetic drift and things like gene flow but we should keep in mind that all variation we find in adult morphology has a root in development uh, these little cuties are bat embryos, by the way. Which brings us to evolutionary developmental biology. Now, this is changes in development over evolutionary time. And uh, we studied it by using comparative anatomy, uh, gene expression variation. And uh, this variation we look at in time, in place, and in the amount of gene expression. So, where do limbs come from? Um, well, before we had limbs, um, we had fins, and limbs comes from fins. So where do fins come from? Well, we need to go pretty far back in time again, uh, not quite billions of years, but certainly hundreds of millions of years into the time of the, uh, the jawless fish. Here is a a selection of a few of them, which we have found in the fossil record. And when did then fins appear? In, in, fin appears in the fossil record. Well, it seems like the medium fins, which you find on the back of animals, it, it has been around for quite a long time, for at least 500 million years. Um, when it comes to Paired fins, it's a little bit trickier. If we're looking for things like paired fin folds, we can't really tell in the fossil record when it turned up because the, the fossils we have aren't, um, they aren't good enough, essentially. We can't really see. Now, what we can see is when the first pectoral fin uh, appeared, and they appeared in this group of fishes called the osteostracans. And uh, most likely in the Devonian. So we're talking about 400 million years ago. And uh, then the first group where we find pelvic fins uh, are the placoderms, which are uh, roughly overlapping with the uh, osteostracans. So we still have to go back to the Devonian uh, some 400 million years. Now, where do fins come from? 
Well, there are some hypotheses. Uh, nothing comes from nothing, uh, as you have learned from this course. Uh, there are a few hypotheses. Uh, one is that the fins that we have that will eventually evolve into our limbs, they are essentially tail buds that appears in the flanks of the animal. Then there is another hypothesis, which is very attractive to paleontologists. It is that we originally had uh, a long lateral fin fold, which eventually kind of uh, got subdivided into other fins. The problem with this is that fin folds aren't really found in the fossil record, um, which of course is a problem. And then there is something called the Archi Archipterygium hypothesis. This one states that uh, the, the fins are just iterations of the branchial arches. Now, the branchial arches that formed the head skeletons and the, uh, the, the gill support arches in the head. And it, out of a mere coincidence, this paper came out a month ago. Um, which is called Embryonic Origin and Serial Homology of Gill Arches and Paired Fins in Skate. Um, so I thought I'd just, I'd just show you this picture. What these guys did, they, um, they tracked the cells that build the, uh, the branchial arches, the gill arches, and the, uh, the pectoral girdle in, in the little skate. And as everybody knows, the anterior ones, which will make up the, um, the most of the oral apparatus, they are neurocrest cell derived. Now, Raj is going to talk about this in the next lecture because this is this is basic head development stuff. So you have neurocrest uh, anteriorly, and then as you see in this picture, it becomes more and more red-ish, which means that we have a contribution from the mesoderm. And these mesoderm cells are actually lateral plate mesoderm. So we get more and more contribution of lateral plate mesoderm, and eventually it's all lateral plate mesoderm. So their conclusion is that um, the Arctiprygium uh, hypothesis is correct. At least, at least maybe. Um, it's a good hint. As always, we need more data. So how did fin development evolve? Ah, well, sadly, there are no fossil embryos, which I can play with. Um, so we have to work with the closest living, living relatives. And in this case, we will have to look at maybe basal chordates, like this amphioxus, or basal vertebrates, uh, like the lamprey, this is an agnathan, so it, it's a jawless uh, vertebrate. Or we go and look at basal natostomes like sharks or, or skates, as in the paper I just showed you. And we want to know, we want to look at how morphology changes during evolution. And what could be the genetic background to these morphological changes. Ah, yes. Now, this might be looking a bit uh, cluttered, but don't worry. The details are not interesting. Uh, we have uh, Amphioxus, Lamprey, and Shark. And what has happened during evolution is that the Amphioxus doesn't really have lateral plate mesoderm. We start finding that in the Lamprey. And in the Shark, we have a good separation of splanchnic and somatic. Uh, mesoderm. You, you remember that um, the trunk mesoderm gets divided into two parts, the splanchnic that faces the, uh, the elementary canal and the somatic that faces the ectoderm. <clears throat> now, it might, might be interesting to know that this actually happens in the lamprey, but only in the cardiac mesoderm. Uh, in the shark, it happens in the uh, the posterior lateral plate mesoderm as well. And it happens in those areas where we will get the fins forming. Okay, now the amphioxus, since it doesn't really have lateral plate mesoderm, it doesn't have a nested hoxtein expression. We find that in the lamprey, <clears throat> and of course then in the shark. 
Now, engrailed is originally more dorsal in the uh, in the ectoderm. And you might recall that we had engrailed was part of the dorsoventral axis formation in the limbs. But in lamprey, it's impossible because engrailed is too far dorsal. Now, in the shark, however, it has actually reached the border, um, the dorsoventral border, where it is precisely uh, the dorsal expression of engrailed is exactly at at the dorsoventral kind of uh, midline, where we will get uh, apical ectodermal ridge forming. And we get TBX4 and TBX, uh, TBX4 and TBX5 expression in the lateral plate mesoderm as well, where we will get uh, limb buds forming. And all this stuff is things that you, you learned from the last lecture. Okay, so let's look at a, an outline of this. We start with Amphioxus. It doesn't have the lateral plate really. Uh, as time goes on, we have a separation. We, we get lateral plate mesoderm. We have a, a separation of cardiac mesoderm and posterior lateral, lateral plate mesoderm. We get the onset of Hox gene expression within the uh, lateral plate mesoderm. Uh, as time goes on, we also get uh, the origin of apical ectodermal ridge forming zones in, in the lateral part. We get the split between somatic and splanchnic uh, lateral plate mesoderm in the fin forming domains. And as you saw, we get TBX4 and 5 expression within the lateral plate mesoderm. Okay, um, then what does this limb development program come from? because again, that doesn't appear out of nowhere. Now, as you remember from the earlier pictures is that the median fins are much, much older than the paired fins. And people have been looking at uh, the development of the median fins. And it turns out that you have uh, the same nested expression of Hox 9 to 13 genes during the, uh, the medium fin development. So it seems like at least the Hox gene expression pattern is, is very similar between the median fin and uh, the paired fins. However, um, you don't have the sonic hedgehog and FTF feedback loop in the dorsal fin, but you do find it in the gill arches. So maybe there was a co-option of different parts of the program and they kind of combined in the development of the, the paired fins. Okay, so now we have a fin. Um, how do we get from a fin to a limb? How do we get a tetrapod, a four-legged animal? This is um, a brief outline of uh, some of the players. We have, uh, well, we have a lot of fish at the bottom. Um, Lungfishes, this is the Australian lungfish. It's our closest living uh, fish relative. And all of these are then uh, fossils, apart from Charles Darwin. And as we see, we have a, a gradual change in how the, the fins slowly kind of transforms into a limb. I should probably point out that these are fish, 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 fish. All of these have gills um, up until here, where this guy has lost the gills, but as you see, they still have kind of a tail fin. So it took quite a while to become properly terrestrial. So that, I mean, only living on land, and it happened fairly late, I mean, by evolutionary standards, anyway. Uh, Okay, let's take a closer look. So how did fins transform into limbs? Well, um, we have shark fins down here and we have uh, actinopterygium fins, which is our sister group, uh, that polyodon and zebrafish. And here we have all these, um, these fossils up until mouse. 
So what's happened is that we had a, we've had a loss of the anterior bones. Because if you look at these, these fish fins, uh, we can divide them into a propterygium, a mesopterygium, and a metapterygium. And what has happened in the evolution uh, towards our limbs is that we lost the propterygium and the mesopterygium. So we have an expansion of the metapterygium. And uh, we can see that in this, um, in this sketch. We see we have an increase in the zygopod and the stylopod. As you remember, the stylopod is, is the upper arm and the zygopod is the lower arm. And we can see that in, during evolution. However, the autopod, we don't really know. Is that an evolutionary novelty? Um, now let's look into changes, uh, more changes in limb development. We can look at genes and things. Um, these are the most common lab animals, which you know we're looking at. In the zebrafish, we see that the, um, the apical ectoderma ridge is active pretty shortly, and then it gets replaced by something called an apical ectodermal fold. And this fold produces um, this part, the actinotrichia, which is what we consider, when you look at a normal fish, this is what you think of as the fin part of the fish. That comes from the apical ectodermal uh, fold. Now the mouse, and they, they are just continue going. So you will have an extended uh, limb bud forming, while the limb bud in, in well, the fin bud in the zebrafish is kind of small. Um, but it would be good to look at some uh, more animals because these are only two. So if we, if we add shark and paddlefish to our steam, we will notice that um, the AER lasts longer in shark and paddlefish than in zebrafish, uh, which also means that they would produce more bones in their fins, which you can see. Now the, the zebrafish is uh, very reduced in the number of bones, while the shark and the paddlefish has a lot more. Um, another interesting thing is that if we're looking at uh, Hox D13 expression, if we look at it early in the, the fin and limb buds, we can see that it's in the posterior region, as you know from the first phase. It's in the posterior region in all these animals. Uh, if you look at the late phase, in zebrafish, it's still in the posterior region. While in the mouse, as you remember, there is this inversion in the expression pattern, and Hox T13 is spread all the way to the anterior part in mouse. Apparently, that also happens in paddlefish and shark, although to a much lesser degree. Um, okay, so what's happened is that we are losing the apical ectodermal fold, and we're losing the fin rays. See, when you look at your own hand, you, you don't see any fin rays. Uh, yes, extended development. Okay. Um, if we look at hox genes, more hox genes, we will notice that in... Um, Hox A genes, this is Hox A11 and A13, we notice that they don't really look like they have this inverse collinearity that we have in Hox D13 and or, or in the Hox D genes. So this is the first phase and this is the second phase. And as you see in the first phase, D13 is in the posterior, and in the second phase, what happens is that you have a gradual expansion of D13 and all the other uh, D genes to the uh, anterior part. Uh, now what's happened is that, uh, as you remember, the three prime enhancers, they drive the proximal uh, expression. And the five prime enhancers drive the distal expression. You can um, put a zebrafish enhancer and uh, put it in a mouse, and it's capable of driving the expression in the proximal part but not in the distal limb band. If you do the reverse, you put the mouse enhancer, this one drives the expression in the whole of the zebrafish limb bud. It doesn't recreate uh, a mouse limb bud, uh, sadly. Um, this paper actually came out 
a few months ago too, where some crazy people decided to work on Australian lungfish, since you remember that this is the uh, our closest fish uh, relative. And um, this is the their, their, their summary uh, figure of that paper. Um, we have Hox A13 in sort of yellow and orange. Uh, we have the ontogeny here. This is the development of the, the fin bud of a zebrafish. This is the fin bud of a, of a lungfish. And this is then the limb bud of a mouse. And as we already saw in the previous slide for uh, Hox A18, uh, we see it, it's kind of, um, um, it's spread all through the, the fin buds and the limb buds. Uh, we have uh, some and we have an anterior gene like alex4 in the fish we see it stays in the anterior part in the lungfish it kind of extends all the way to the to the distal end as well well in the mouse it stays kind of uh, in the proximal part so it's kind of it reminds you more of a of a zebrafish than of a lungfish we also have a uh, hand two, which is a posterior gene, which stays in the posterior part all the time. And then we have Hox D13. And as you already know, in, in the zebrafish, it stays in the posterior part. In the lungfish, it also stays in the posterior part, but it kind of extends all the way to the distal tip. And in the mouse, what happens is that it slowly moves anteriorly. So you will have a, a gradual expansion of the posterior domain. The posterior domain kind of grows into the ante onto the anterior side. And if you look at, um, so this is then a more, uh, a more adult, uh, well, let's call it a late stage lungfish fin, but well, it's lungfish fin. It's a it's a larval fin, but uh, and if we compare this with a mouse, what we see has happened is that this is the the metapterygial axis. So this is uh, sort of the center line of the of the fin. We see that in the mouse, it's bent. It has uh, bent itself anteriorly, and what was originally this posterior region in the in the lungfish has now become the distal region in the mouse. So when you're looking at your, your own hand, um, looking at is essentially the expansion of the posterior part of a lungfish fin. At least uh, that's the idea. Now we can't really tell if these um, bone elements in the lungfish fin are homologous, are homologous to the, uh, the fingers, the digits of a, of a mouse limb yet. So we need more, exper uh, more experiments. Sadly, it is really, really hard to get hold of these embryos now since they shut down the breeding colony some um, 10 years ago. Anyway, uh, let's continue. Now we've gotten limbs. Um, of course, you know that we have a huge variation in limbs. Um, so how does how is this achieved? We, we've seen that the pattern is the same. Uh, how do we how do we get to this variation? I'm sure you notice in in this picture that we have um, we have a lot of losses happening. We have extensions and we have losses. For example, in the horse, we only have uh, one digit. We have uh, lots of extended digits in whales. And then, yeah, yeah, we know that the bird has reductions also in, in their hand part. So it seems like we can gain things and we can lose things. And the way to lose things uh, can be divided into well, at least two different modes. You can either have pattern mode of digital loss, which, uh, as you might imagine, means that um, the digits are never patterned at all. Uh, you, you remember the, uh, the formation of the hand part during development. That was the previous lecture. 
So you can imagine that um, you just don't pattern these um, the digits at all. And this happens in chicken. Um, there, are, uh, there are digit losses in a lot of uh, lizard species. And interesting, interestingly, also in cow and pig. The other way of thinking is that we can, um, you can pattern the, the digits and then they just die before they form uh, cartilages or bones. And this happens in, uh, in the jerboa or in the camel and also in the horse. So what it means is that you have the formation of, uh, in the horse at least, you form three digits and then the, the lateral two dies due to uh, apoptosis. Um, what we can't see in this image is the, um, the flipper of a whale, as you remember. Let's see here. You see that it has a, a very extended um, an arch of the digits are really extended and long. And what's happened here is that, as far as we know, I mean, as you can imagine, it's, it's really hard to get hold of whale embryos because, yeah, we don't get many. Um, but people have studied uh, things that you find in museums and uh, they have come up with the idea that, well, it seems like the apical ectodermal ridge is the, the lifespan of the apical ectodermal ridge is much, much longer um, during whale embryology, which means that their limb bud will be extended, which for some reason causes extension in the, uh, in the digits. Okay, so let's go to a brief summary. Um, you remember the paraffins appeared in Agnathan fish? Oh yeah, sorry, by the way, the background picture of this, this is a jerboa. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I need to talk about this. But did anybody go to the, uh, the talk of uh, Kimberly Cooper? I think she came to, um, it was either, I think it was this year's uh, annual talks or at some kind of some symposia last year. Um, she works on uh, jerboas and jerboas, I mean, look at them, they're so cute. Look at these bizarrely extended uh, hind limbs and well, they do actually fold in their uh, forelimbs so you can't see them because it's easier when they're running. Um, you, you might wonder, how did this happen? And what's really curious is that when these uh, little babies are born, they have the same proportions in limb size between forelimb and hindlimb as mice pup. So all that you see here is postnatal development. And it happens within the first few weeks of uh, the lifespan of this jerboa. So everything doesn't happen in utero. That, that, that's a good thing for you to remember. Okay. Um, yeah, back to the plan. Uh, yes, parrot fins appeared in Agnathan fish. You remember that? Um, you remember that we had a separation of the, the lateral plate mesoderm. We get the cardiac and the posterior lateral plate mesoderm. We got the separation of in the mesoderm into splanchnic and somatic. And we get the nested, nested Hox gene expression in the lateral plate mesoderm. Um, and we know that limbs evolved from fins in Sarcoptrygian fish, because we can see that in the fossil record. And we can see that it's because of a uh, loss of the anterior bones that we find in more basal fish like sharks. And also that there is a loss of the fin fold, which kind of the fin fold will restrict how big the limb bud gets. And it will also add these uh, uh, the actinotrichia, the fin part uh, at the doors, uh, at the end of the, of the fin. And we can suspect that what's happened when we evolve a hand is that there were additional enhancers 
in the five prime Hoxstein complex popping up. There are people looking at this actually. Um, the first author of this uh, lungfish fintolin paper, he is working on, uh, he is analyzing the, the lungfish um, Hoxstein uh, operon to see uh, if, yeah, what's happened. And we know that there is a, there has been a posteriorization of the anterior distal domain. It at least makes it look like our limbs are extensive. Well, our our digits are essentially just the uh, the posterior part of the lungfish fin, which has kind of uh, bent forward. And we have seen that there are many ways to reduce a limb. Uh, there is either pre-patterning where the the digits are lost. Well, the digits are the digits are, are just never patterned, um, or we have post-patterning, uh, which means that the the digits are patterned, but then they die from apoptosis before they uh, are properly formed. Yes, this lecture was a lot shorter, but it also gives us time for questions. Uh, on this one and on the previous one. Yeah, speaking of the previous one, um, I tried to see if anyone had had done um, like general overexpression of Sonic Hedgehog, um, but it, it seems difficult to make because it seems like it just makes a huge mess everywhere. Um, so I don't think we can we can create such an embryo and make it survive for very long it seems highly embryonic lethal. What people usually do is that they overexpress it in whatever organ they are studying. And, and um, you might also notice that if you search for Sonic Hedgehog online, most of the hits will involve cancer because Sonic Hedgehog is um, it's involved not only as a sort of a, a patterning signal, but it's involved in cell pr proliferation which of course is part of many cancers. Okay, so if anyone is still awake out there, um, any questions, comments, ideas, visions of the future? Hey, Rolf. Hey. So um, you mostly talked about four limb development, right? Um, well, a lot of the things are applicable to hind limb as well. Yes. Okay. Okay. I mean, okay. if you remember from the, the previous lecture, what we essentially don't know about hind limb development is that um, to, to initiate um, the development of the limb bud. In the forelimb, we have retinoic acid, but in the hind limb, we don't have retinoic acid. So we don't know what the initial signal is to, to start the, the initiation of the hind limb development. Um, yeah. So that's a problem, but it's also an opportunity to study something in more detail. Sorry. Do you want to develop your question? No, no, no. I, I th that was my question. Okay. And I just w was wondering if there were fundamental differences between those two. Uh, no. I, see that I can't answer it right now. Um, it's interesting. I mean, the whole idea that you're kind of you getting a copy of the forelimb, you know, further. I mean, the forelimb appeared first. And then they were kind of copied further down the body, which is weird, isn't it? Uh, so one, one wonders um, what the signals are that kind of uh, co-opted this whole uh, process of making a limb. Um, and this we don't know. Oh yeah, there are lots of limbless snakes. Well, snakes are limbless, as you know. Well, actually, they're not entirely limbless. If you look at the python, for example, you will see that uh, they 
quite commonly have, um, uh, they can get hind limbs, really, really tiny ones. And, and they still have, um, they have remnants of a pelvic girdle, which is interesting. And uh, it seems like the mode of limb loss is different uh, in uh, limbless dis lizards and in snakes, which again is kind of interesting. I see. And I had another question. Yes, so please. In amphibian species, is metamorphosis, right? From fish like tadpoles to adults with limbs. Yes. So is there a similarity or? How does the transition from a fin to a limb happen in one animal there? Um, well, they don't actually form uh, paired fins uh, before a metamorphosis. So if you look at a tadpole, um, they, you will have the, the dorsal fin in the tadpole. The dorsal fin will disappear. It will get uh, absorbed during metamorphosis and they will form um, they will start forming the, the four limbs, not as thin, but they come out as buds and they, then they form limbs straight away. So there is no intermediate fin forming um, prior or during uh, metamorphosis. At least not what I can tell. It's interesting because um, if you look at, uh, if you compare a salamander embryo to a lungfish embryo, uh, well, let's put it like this. If you've never seen a lungfish embryo and you see it, you will think it's a salamander because they, looks, they look pretty much identical uh, the way they develop. And um, uh, the, the early fins kind of looks like um, limb buds, early limb buds of, uh, of salamanders. But the salamander form uh, limbs directly, of course, and the lungfish forms their lungfish fins. So there's no, there's no transition during development. That would have been really cool. But as far as we know, that's not what's happening. I see. Thank you. No worries. Anything else? Are you all looking forward to the final lecture, the head lecture? You should, because it's gonna be awesome. Okay, unless we have no more, any more questions, I guess it's, um, it's Merry Christmas to you guys.